Hello! It's time to start this week's Open Studio stream. Let me quickly, I'm going to try to do Instagram TV again. I've got it set up here. Let me try to activate that. Oh, come on. It doesn't seem to be wanting to go live on Instagram. I don't know why I've got power to it and everything. It's like it's trying to connect. Come on, come on. Hmm, this is frustrating. I really liked when I was able to stream on Instagram live, but now it's okay. Let me try all over again. Live. Connecting. Oh, come on, please connect. Yay! Yay! <laughs> I connected on Instagram. <laughs> it's been like three weeks since that's actually worked because I think last week we had outer bands of the hurricane that had come through. Here I'm in central North Carolina in the Piedmont area. And then the week before that, I my phone didn't have enough reception to stream on Instagram, so I'm really excited to be back on Instagram and YouTube. And yeah, it's Open Studio Stream. I see I have a couple of viewers on YouTube and a couple on uh, Instagram Live, so I'm considering that a success. <laughs> All right, so this week, I um, I have lots of things to share with you guys. And I, I guess I'll just start with the Regency bonnet that I was, that I still am, planning to reproduce. Um, this is for, I believe, I, I looked it up. I'm, I'm giving a lecture, I've been saying in March, but I finally looked it up this week, and it's actually April 7th that I'm part of a lifelong learning program on uh, Jane Austen and fashion and accessories of the Regency era. So when I originally booked that lecture, um, this was pre-pandemic, pre-lockdown, all of that. I was still at the theater all day, every day, Monday through Friday. And I had planned to just have the convenience of running down to costume stock and pulling some bonnets, you know, at, at Playmakers, which is the professional theater where I work, we have done dramatizations of several Jane Austen stories. Um, we did Pride and Prejudice. We did Sense and Sensibility. So the point is I've made quite a few different styles of Regency bonnets, and those have remained in the costume stock at Playmakers. So I had thought when I was agreed to do this lecture that I could just run downstairs and pull some visual aids, which I still might be able to do by the time it's April 7th. Um, there's a, the plan is that some people will still be able to work on site in limited capacities, like our manager is there, our program director teaches on site a couple of days a week, and the students can sign up for access to the studio. So it's possible, it's highly likely even, that I would be able to call up my, to email my manager and say, these are the bonnets that I need for this lecture. Could you please pull them from stock and then go pick them up? Um, low con no contact pickup where I just drive up and she puts them in the back of my car and I go away. That's how we've been handling it so far. But, and it's worked fine. But I don't want to rely on that because everything is so up in the air with how the progression of the virus infection rates are going to go um, that I, I don't want, you know, let me see if I can pull you guys a little closer because I can see that people are commenting and I can't read what you're saying because you're too far away. Am I going to be able to pull this or is it going to pull my camera off the top of this? <laughs> oh. Now I'm going to have to get up here and squint. Oh, hi, Arlene. Arlene is in the, the YouTube chat, and I see that someone... Oh, God, my eyesight is so bad. I'm going to have to get up here and squint. Mm, I 
you're telling your followers that you've started a new video. Hang on, we're telling you. Okay, I thought it was comments on Instagram, and it's really Instagram trying to drum up viewership for me. <laughs> anyway, um, good to see you in the chat, Arlene. Um, Arlene works at UNC with me. Well, I mean, not with me in the same department, but she also works at the university. So, And we, in better times, we ride the same bus to, to and from work sometimes. Um, but I was talking about this Regency bonnet and how when I give my lecture, it's possible that I can access the costume stock at work and, and pick up some of the bonnets that I've made for Jane Austen adapt, stage adaptations in the past. But just in the interest of, of covering all my bases in this land of pandemic, um, I found this research image of a, a spiral straw Regency bonnet that was auctioned recently at a uh, vintage clothing and antique clothing dealer. And I liked the shape and I also had just been given quite a lot of this straw braid yardage um, in, in a donation. And so I thought that I would just make a bonnet for the sake of making one and also to have a project to be working on in case my students drop by the studio stream then it's it's demonstrating technique that they haven't seen before um oh i see kim is in the chat on it's or at least joined over on instagram television hey kim kim is a milliner with hat knit hats here in the chapel hill area so that's really exciting to have local support for milliners but i also talked with earlier a friend who is a milliner in Barcelona, Spain, Cristina de Prada, and she mentioned that she might drop by. So if you're here, Cristina, it's good to see you. Um, oh, someone else. Oh, Creative Costume Academy. That's Trisha. Yay, I have more friends joining us. So in making this bonnet, the last time that you saw it on this stream, we had gotten really just this far. We had the crown, I say we, I mean I, had the crown put together um, and I was demonstrating spiral straw construction for my graduate students because at least two of them are doing projects with by this method and so I, I just wanted to, to work on one myself um, to remind myself of tips and tricks that you need to use when you work with, with spiral braid um, in case one of them had questions or in case they just wanted to watch me demonstrating um, something that is a variation on what they're working on. So you see now I have made quite a bit of progress on this bonnet towards uh, what it's, oops, what it's going to be like. Um, I have, I, I, I took these measurements in millimeters to, to figure out the scale from the drawing to blowing up to real size. And what I determined, um, I, I went based off of this open work straw medallion in the tip of the crown because that was the one element that I didn't have control over. This is a vintage piece that I salvaged from a damaged spiral straw hat uh, that was donated. And I, I loved this beautiful work that they've done here with this very fine narrow braid and wanted to preserve that even though the rest of the hat was damaged to the point that you really couldn't repair it. Um, so I did salvage that and, and if you recall from past streams or if you have not watched past streams I used my new braid to build out this crown down the side band of this crown. So vocabulary wise this is the tip and this is the side band and together they form the crown. And then I got to the point where I couldn't get it under my sewing machine anymore. So I sewed maybe four or five of these revolutions of braid by hand on this stream. I'm sure those were very boring streams and it was really me just running my mouth because like, I am such a slow hand sewer. Um, but now I was able, I got to the point where I was able to get it back under my sewing machine. And that was also coincidentally the point at which Instead of it being revolutions of spiral straw, it began to be pieced in strips because there's there's this opening at the back of the bonnet where, of course, it goes onto your head. Like it can't continue to spiral because you couldn't get your neck up in here. So uh, at the point where it, 
it went from being spiral to being C shapes that got stacked into the brim. Then I was definitely able to get it under the sewing machine. Um, I had originally, when I was building it up, I was sewing the braid from the inside on this part of the crown. But as soon as we got out to the bell of the brim, I began applying them on the outside. Um, if you look at this edge here, you can see that I was going by the shape of this bonnet and where it seemed like it broke away into the brim. I have a couple of revolutions where it's, it's grading up from that cap into the brim, but I'm, I'm going to, when I finish this, like, oop, I knocked over my water. Ooh, I'll have to clean that up later. It's just water, it's fine. Um, I put this down here because I was like, oh, I was getting all scratchy voiced last time. I put my water close by. And then I kicked it over really smooth. Huh? <laughs> oh, well, Riley loves to lick water off of things. He'll come clean that up in a minute. Um, if you look where the edge of this brim is, the I've cut the braid raw along this edge here. And my plan is for the last, once, once I get this bonnet out as far as it's going to go, then the last row of braid will actually start from the inside of the crown, fold out and top, basically top stitch or bind over that edge along there, along there, and then it'll fold up, do the last row of braid here, fold again, and go back securing and covering those cut edges, and then I'll tuck it back into the crown here. And then there will be all kinds of, of lovely stuff on the inside, like the, the brim lining will probably be some kind of ruched delicate fabric or lace or something. Um, but, so that's the plan right now. I may change that, I may decide to bind that with a bias strip of fabric, or even with a very lightweight strip of leather, I don't know. Um, but I, I will figure that out when I get to it because that's kind of the way that you have to do things as a theatrical milliner. It's good to plan in advance and have an idea, but then often you're working on a hat style you have not worked on before, or it's been, you know, five years since you made one. So you can do research, you can ask other people what they think. Uh, but you really also have to make split second decisions and finish stuff off in time to get it on stage. Now I have a long production window on this. I don't need this done till um, April 7th. Um, but I'm trying to get a head start on it because I know there will be things that trip me up. I see Arlene has a question in or, or a statement in the YouTube chat. You anticipated, oh, I anticipated her question, um, wondering how you'd trim the raw edges. Yes. Um, so I, I have several ideas and, and that my best one, I think so far is that straw braid as a top applied, uh, not binding because it doesn't bind the edge, but it would stabilize the edge. Uh, but I may discover that I'm not going to, maybe I'm not going to line the interior of the brim after all. And then you just see this ugliness in there and I don't want, uh, quadruple thickness of braid here on the overlaps. So I put something like a bias binding of fabric or chamois. Um, we'll see when we get there. Now, this is as far along as it is. When I put it on, I mean, if I were making this bonnet for playmakers, I would be done now. Like this would be done because performer that would be wearing it would have probably a wig in a updo style of the period that this bonnet would sit on. So the bonnet would probably sit on that actor's head, something like this. And if you look at the side profile here, the stage lights still can reach my face. And that is the primary concern when you're making a costume for the stage. Like the way that these bonnets actually were in the Regency era, I mean, look how deep that bonnet brim is. This woman's face is like three or four inches down in there. So this is something that I actually would like to ask your opinion on because 
I'm not making this bonnet for the stage. I don't need, uh, even if a, even if a designer brought me this image and was like, I want this bonnet for Elizabeth Bennet, I would still wind up with a bonnet with a shorter brim because of the lighting designer's requirements. Like, they're, the only way I could have this bonnet with this scale on stage would be if they were willing to light her from below to shine up in there, but then that makes everybody look like Frankenstein. So unless we were doing a dramatization of Pride and Prejudice and zombies, that is not going to fly. So if this is ever going to go on stage, I need to stop within the next row or two and call this done and then begin trimming it out and lining it and do whatever else I'm going to do for it. But because I'm building it as a visual aid for a lecture on Regency fashion and my research image is not for someone playing a Regency woman on stage, it's for someone who was living her life in that time period, then it's, if I'm going to replicate this bonnet exactly, um, that brim is 25 centimeters deep. And this brim is, let's just measure here. This brim is 17 centimeters deep. So if I'm going to, to actually copy this research image, you know, I need another, it's about one centimeter per revolution. So I would need another eight rows of braid in order to get this as deep as the original bonnet is. So Arlene votes for full coal scuttle. <laughs> um, that's my question, is if I'm copying this bonnet, I need to do eight more rows of braid, which I have, I have that braid, and I am physically capable of doing that. But it also guarantees that like when this bonnet is done, I, other than giving this lecture, I don't have any personal plans for it. You know, I, um, I don't tend to go to historical, uh, interpreter sites and dress in Regency fashion. I know plenty of people do that. Um, you know, at, on the campus at UNC every year in non-pandemic times, we have a Jane Austen conference every summer where um, some of the people are, are living history folks. And so if I were building it for that purpose, I would go ahead and finish out this brim to the 25 centimeter depth. Um, but I had kind of thought when I was done with this that I would put it into the costume stock at Playmakers, in which case it can't be 25 centimeters deep because no lighting designer is gonna let that go on stage. So if I, if I envision this bonnet as having a life beyond just the context of the lecture for which I'm originally building it. If I, if I envision it actually going on stage in a show someday, which, as I've said, we've done two Jane Austen ad stage adaptations in the time I've been at Playmakers, um, it's possible that we would do more. But we haven't done Emma the play yet, so, you know, the, the, the idea that this would have a future life in a show is not impossible. Um, it's not a, a ridiculous assumption, but if I build it out to 25 centimeters, then if a costume designer pulls it for a show and wants to use it, I'll just have to remove those last eight rows of braid, which is possible. We do that kind of stuff in the theater all the time. Um, so I'm torn. Um, Arlene wants me to go full on out to the 25 centimeters. Um, I, w I would love uh, some other input. I see there are more people watching. Um, I don't know. I, I'm, my original impulse is to go ahead and make it exactly like the research 
And if we did want to use it on stage, then I would just reduce the depth of the brim in some future circumstance. Um, but the reason I have stopped here at this depth of brim is not because I was completely struggling with, should I build it out more? That's a sort of a side effect from the fact that I was forced to stop here because I ran out of thread that matches. Um, so, oh, good point. Arlene says, add so much hair to the wig, the hat sits farther back. That, I mean, hairstyles from this age have, you know, significant stuff back here for the bonnet to sit on and be sort of anchored on. So they, they do tend to ride high. Like this is, when I put it on my head, and it lays against my head, it's, it's sitting much more flush than it actually would if I had the hairdo from the time, which would be like this. Um, but I'm not able to make any more progress on this until my reordered a straw colored thread comes in. <laughs> I used up a whole spool and this is how far I got. And that's what caused my existential crisis as to you know whether I need to make it longer or not. Some other things I'm thinking about with respect to this bonnet, um, I think it was the last studio stream last week where I uh, began braiding together the more narrow braid that, that I salvaged from the hat that this medallion came from. Um, that hat had a, a side band that was probably about four inches deep and it had been crushed and so there were sections of it that were damaged. But I was able to salvage substantial lengths of, of the braid and was sort of wondering aloud what to do with it, uh, wondering in text what to do with it um, on another Milliner Studio stream that week. Denise Wallace Spriggs, who may or may not be here, she sometimes drops in. Um, and she was talking about straw braid as well. And she uh, demonstrated, or no, she didn't really demonstrate, she just mentioned a technique of taking a narrow braid and braiding sections of it to create a thicker braid of braids. And so the last week's studio stream, I began braiding some of this narrow braid from the open work medallion. And I, I didn't get very far. I think I got maybe half a yard uh, because I was trying to braid it flat here on the table while I'm talking in the open studio stream and and that was not the speediest way to go about it but I'm happy to report that I was able to complete braiding all well not all of the yardage and I, I, I divided the length that I had into thirds and I didn't have enough like I, I was able to divide it into three equal pieces and then I had some left over so I still have some single width braid, like what is used in this uh, open work medallion here, but then I have a pretty substantial lengthy hank of three strand braid created from that narrow braid that was used. So I'm kind of thinking, especially if slash when I build this bonnet out even farther, whether I want to use this now it's it I braided this and then I stay stitched it down the middle by machine and then I ironed it flat so you know you have to imagine this was really kind of scrutely and, and scribbly when I finished braiding it but I, to control it and flatten it out um, that stay stitching and pressing really helped and now it's sort of like a scalloped braid and I was thinking about using this. So the width of it, if you compare it to, this is the braid that I spiraled most of this bonnet with. And this is the braid that I created from the narrow braid. They're very similar in width. And so I thought about using the scalloped braid to piece in a section so that, that this bonnet, let's say it's gonna be this deep of a brim, that there'd be a little stripe of maybe three rows of scalloped braid and then three rows of the 
break from which the rest of it is made and it'd just be a nice little detail. Um, and then I will have extra of this that can be used potentially to decorate the crown. Like if we look at this crown, they have some pretty wide ribbon here. They have some flowers, um, some trimming around the, the front of the bonnet edge. Uh, so, so I would not be going way out on a limb by piecing in some of this new braid. And I'm kind of interested in how that would look aesthetically. So maybe I'll make a sample of it. Um, I did have, so these are, when you get to, I, I, I think I mentioned when I, when this braid was donated, I thought it was one big long length of braid and it was actually like eight shorter pieces of braid. And so every time, especially on this brim section, when I get to a point where I'm to the end of a bundle of braid, but there's not enough to do yet another arc around the brim, then I save the leftover and I've, I started making these little trim elements that, you know, that could be straw pseudo flowers that are adorning the bonnet here. Um, maybe, I don't know. Um, and then this one, which is a triple thickness of triple row of that braid, this is proof that I screwed this up once. Uh, back when I started beginning the brim, I didn't really, if you look at the edge here, I didn't gauge the right place for the brim itself to jut off. I went too far with this part that's really just supposed to coast around the neckline of the wearer, you know, like the, the crown, the base of the crown sits at the base of your hairstyle and then it goes around to the point where the brim comes off. I, this point here where it begins to angle down I guessed wrong as to where that should go and I got three rows too far and realized I really need to move that point back on the structure of the bonnet so that's why I, I and instead of taking off each row of braid I just stripped off the three that I'd gone too far and left them stitched together and then that's how I got this sort of of you know, remembrance ribbon of a triple width of braid. Um, so let me take these wonder clips off. So this part was was part of my bonnet, and, and I realized I'd gone too far, so I took it off. Um, and I'm not throwing it away because I really might use this to decorate the bonnet somehow. I mean, not on its own, but with some ribbon and some silk flowers, that could be really cool. Um, we'll see when we get there. I, I, if you remember back to the very beginning of these streams, if you've been with me that long, um, you recollect the philosophy of a, a trim story where um, you come up with a collection of things that could be used to trim that hat out that are, you know, all coordinating or matching colors. And then when it comes to time to decorate it, I pin it all on there and leave it sitting on the head for a couple of days to just sort of live with it and absorb whether I think that's the right trim or not. And um, back in the beginning of this stream, when I was trimming out some hats for a charity auction, I did three different trim, trim stories on a blocked straw top hat. Finally wound up deciding on one and putting it on there. And so I'm gonna do that same thing with this hat. Like once I finish the depth of the brim, probably the next time you will see it because next Thursday is Thanksgiving if I'm here in the U.S., if I'm not mistaken, and there I won't be streaming on Thanksgiving. Um, I also won't be having people over to my house because of the pandemic, which is unfortunate because we had thought maybe we could find a, a way for my parents to safely visit because they were going to quarantine for two weeks and we were going to quarantine for two weeks, but then they got scared because they're old and super high risk, and I was kind of relieved because I'm high risk as well. So long story short, they're not coming, but we're still doing Thanksgiving, and um, so I'm not going to stream studio time because it won't be working that day. It's holiday. So by the time you see this bonnet again, that would be maybe two weeks from now, studio stream, 
and hopefully, ideally, in my perfect dream, then I'm done with the bell of the broom and I have a trim story pinned out and we look at that trim story and then I have another collection of a alternative trims that I trim out in next week's stream, maybe. We'll see. Um, is that everything I wanted to say about the Regency bonnet? Oh, I have another little... So I have all of these um, braid ends that I have made into little potential ornaments. And I even have this one, which I think is pretty cute. This one is definitely um, Alyssa Opashinsky. Hello, New England. Welcome. Glad to have you here. Um, more people in the chat on YouTube. Less people, well, not less people, just less active folks, less chatty folks on Instagram. Um, this, I like this little trim element from this end of straw braid, but it, it reads very contemporary to me. I will not be using this one um, on this Regency bonnet because this is not Pride and Prejudice and Zombies. This is not a contemporary reinterpretation. This is meant to be a Regency bonnet reproduction. So these I think are, are I, I could buy these a lot more because I've seen this configuration of ribbon in the period and so to do it with straw braid is is just a no no brainer like yes you can do that this too contemporary um oh someone oh ninja kittens that's my friend beth um learning the phrases of trim story yes <laughs> beth is somebody i've known for a long time uh, we both lived in boston at the same time so that's been quite a while ago um, it's good to see you on here. She is crocheting along at home from her baby's nursery. Um, oh, there's one other thing I wanted to say about this bonnet before I move on to the next thing that I wanted to share with you guys today. And that is in a past stream, I mentioned that, uh, or I, I sort of hypothesized, I was thinking aloud about the fact that the braid that was used to create this lace work on the open work uh, tip of the, the bonnet crown that that this braid was too I felt too narrow for the Regency period that I had never seen a hat from that time with such narrow braid that that read to me very contemporary in the same way that, that this just sort of instinctively reads very contemporary to me um, and in the intervening time I have actually seen some hats created with straw braid that is this narrow and um, bonnet shapes like this and even a couple of straw men's top hats so I was very gratified to see those they were um, they were on the page of a museum in Britain and it was really exciting to see those and, and to be proven wrong because I had thought, well, there's no way that, well, there, there was never going to be a, a world in which I was stitching eighth inch straw braid into a shape because I don't have the machine that you need to do that. You, I guess you could do it on a domestic sewing machine, but it'd be like threading a needle with a piece of yarn. Like it, you, you just would drive you crazy. Um, but point is that narrow braid did exist in the Regency time period and people put hats together with it. I am not one of them. <laughs> so that's where we're at with the Regency bonnet reproduction. And let me just push all that stuff away and put this guy off to the side. Um, guy. I don't know why I, I have this tendency to, to gender inanimate objects and they're he's and she's and stuff and it's an it, it's a bonnet, right? Um, so those of you who are on YouTube can see, but those of you who are on Instagram, I'm going to have to reach behind here and get, there's, there's a hat that is on a model in the background just out of the view of the Instagram portrait orientation but you guys can see it on uh, YouTube this hat behind me on my mannequin head this mannequin head is not Zelda Zelda is in the other room this mannequin head I call her Mavis <laughs> and she is wearing 
a fur felt hat from the 40s that I made this week that I'm so, so proud of. And I'm not going to work on it in this studio stream because I've already finished it, but I wanted to show it to you guys and talk really quickly about how I made this hat because um, it's something that, that you could do too. And in fact, the video that I'm going to, um, to upload on my channel on Monday this week is a sort of a, a quick tutorial slash survey of how this thing is made. So it's going to be a lot more concise and, and put together than me just blivering about it here in the live stream. But this hat came from I had this great idea. Um, see, I wanted to work with fur felt skirting um, in the mid 20th century and actually probably before that but it really became popular in the 50s that fur felt was manufactured in large scale wide width of a flat fabric from which you could sew garments and accessories and the most popular thing that was made with flat fur felt is poodle skirts in the 50s and not just poodle skirts they were really more novelty skirts because you can find them with uh, Christmas trees or kitty cats or fish swimming like it was more applique motif skirts and and they're a full circle in the profile of the hem with some sort of applique of something cute on it and um, People made them themselves. I mean, they, they were mass manufactured as well, but they were a home sewing craft type thing um, that a lot of people liked to, to make for themselves. And nowadays, that type of felt, the flat type, is not manufactured. It's like the felt that hat bodies are made from, but that's really the only form in which you can buy that felt manufactured contemporarily is in a hat body, so it's shaped like a cone, you know, like a gumdrop. Um, or a capoline, where it's shaped like a floppy Jed Clampett hillbilly hat. Um, and I had read a lot of stuff about hats in the 40s manufactured out of that felt. And of course, I have found a bunch of them in the costume storage at work and in the costume archive, um, where they're made out of flat felt and stitched together the way that a, a flat cap or a, a beanie is, is sewn together from fabric. And I really wanted to work with that. So I decided that I was going to, if you can't buy that yardage, but you maybe could find those vintage skirts. I set up a, a search on eBay for vintage 1950s flat felt skirts. Um, poodle skirts and and also all these other different appliques and I decided I didn't want to invest too much money in this so the ones that that pit, they were you know in fantastic condition and they were going for a hundred dollars or had an interesting motif that was appliqued on them like there was one that had a stagecoach and some horses riding around the the hem of the circle it's really cute um, but those were like a hundred hundred and fifty dollars and I'm like no, and I don't want to destroy some beautiful, pristine thing. So I bid on the ones that had moth damage, or the ones that had tears in the felt. And those, turns out, you can get, the, like, I didn't pay more. I think the one I paid the most for was $35, but I bought four of those skirts. And they're starting to come in now. And this blue felt, this is a beautiful heathered sort of effect of blues, slate blue, navy, um, this skirt came in and it had moth damage and the zipper was jammed. So if I was buying it because I wanted to restore it and wear it, um, then it would need a certain amount of, of restoration of those moth holes and a replacement of that zipper. But I wasn't buying it to wear it. I was buying it to salvage the felt and make a hat. Um, so I did so. And, and this is the hat that, that I made from it. I just love this hat. I mean, 
I will wear this around in my actual life when we're allowed to leave the house safely again. <laughs> um, but this, can you see that? That is the pattern that I found. I'm trying to make it so that you can see it on Instagram and also on YouTube. Um, I found this vintage pattern graphic. I think I found it on Pinterest, maybe. Um, from, and it's, you know, it's clearly like an image from a women's magazine from that time period. I have several of these magazines at the theater um, where they talk about how to make your own hats at home. And um, so, oh, thank you. Kim is in the Instagram chat telling me that she likes it. Um, I use this pattern. It's, it's really excellent. They've got a grid that's inch blocks. So scaling it up is no problem. Like you just need a ruler and the ability to measure. And, um, and I made this up first I, I, because yeah. Okay. A circle skirt. I have quite a bit of felt real estate from that. This first one that I've received and, and taken apart and salvaged, um, even working around the moth holes, I still have quite a bit of flat felt to use, but it's so rare that I didn't want to just trust that this pattern was exactly what I wanted it to be and cut it out in it without seeing practically what it looks like. So I made a mock-up and let me just take it off of Mavis here and put the mock-up on her so you can see what that looks like. Now, this material that I used to make my mock-up, you see this hat? Um, this mock-up is made out of, my partner had a hoodie that was damaged. I could have fixed it, but he was basically like, no, the graphic on it is, is coming off. It's really old. Let's, you know, if you can use it for, anything in your studio just take it so this used to be a sweatshirt um and it it had it was one of those hoodies that the interior side of the knit is a terry cloth texture and i thought that that the the beefiness of that would approximate the beefiness of the fur felt yeah the mock-up does look very 1970s um and i felt the same thing like when i made this up and I used the exact proportions that are in the, the graphic from the period. I, I used those exact proportions and when I made it up, I felt like what to me makes it look very 1970s is the thickness of the crown and the floppiness of the brim as well as the, the width of the brim. The brim is a little bit wider than I tend to think of when I think of the visual properties of 1940s hats. And I definitely thought there was too much room in the crown. So after making this one, I, I knew that I would need to alter this pattern to remove some of that thickness in the crown uh, or, or that space in the crown. And I also wanted to shave some depth off of the brim and impart some stiffness to the material once I went into the felt because the felt is a similar hand to this, you know, like if, if the brim is this wide, the weight of it makes it want to collapse on itself. And that's not the aesthetic that I was going for. Um, so here's the rest of my felt from the skirt. I still have enough to make probably like five or six more hats. Um, but so when you look at the one that I, that I wound up with, you can see how much narrower that crown is compared to this yellow one that we just looked at. And my brim is only a half an inch more narrow, but it really uh, made a difference in terms of how it sits on the head. And then lastly, once it existed, I took it to the bathroom and I put four coats of sizing on it to stiffen it, two on the inside and two on the outside. And really, if I were... If I, uh, if I were at 
work and I had access to the spray booth and the solvent based sizing that we use there, I probably would have only done a single coat of paint on sizing on the inside and then a single coat on the outside. But because of the distribution of an aerosol spray, um, I did two rather than really hose it down with just one very thick coat. Um, so there's uh, m more to that, I guess, that, that I talk about in the video that's going to go live tomorrow. Um, but that's that was a fun project this week once I sort of hit a wall of my thread running out from my Regency bonnet. Um, just in time, my skirt arrived for me to experiment with fur felt skirting and this hat reproduction. Um, so if, if you are interested, I personally, now that I've made it, I feel like everybody on earth would look good in this hat. Um, it is very, to me, the silhouette of this hat is very particular to the 1940s, but really it would look good in any time period and with any hairstyle. Um, so if you are somebody that, that thinks this hat is fantastic and you want to do this project for yourself or, or explore this pattern, perhaps even with just woven fabric and not felt, um, those, I'm going to have the details in that video on Monday. Um, yes, wool felt would also work. Um, Arlene is asking in the YouTube uh, channel, which you can buy wool felt by the yard with some rayon content involved at Judith M. Millinery Supply, judithm.com. Um, or maybe you just have some lying around. Um, plain wool felt would work. Yes. Um, actually, contemporary craft felt from the craft store would work, except it's like polypropylene fibers so it might look kind of cheesy when you're done um I don't know it depends on your taste but um I, th I also think you could do this with boiled wool where it's woven and then felted um or really you know this would be beautiful in um a suede as well I have a, a partial hide of gray suede at the theater that I would love to see this hat made up in as well um so uh, in the video that goes up Monday, I, I cite the particulars of how I altered that vintage pattern to get this shape so that if you want this shape, not the 70s shape of the mock-up that I showed you, then you can copy what I did very easily and, and get the same hat. Um, so that's that. We're at 347, still have a little bit of time, and, and I still I have one other thing that I was thought maybe I would get to, and I think this is the first time I've had this studio stream where I'm actually able to get to everything that I hope that I'm going to get to. <laughs> so, I, oh, here's a part of that, um, a part of the skirt that I saved when I took the skirt apart. This is the waistband, which... I didn't, you couldn't cut one of the hat pieces out of this, but um, Kim, who's in the chat on Instagram, did a, a survey of, of fur felt hat trims when she was taking my millinery class. And one of the one of the ones that she came up with that I really loved was involved basically making spaghetti, cutting very thin strips of felt, and then twisting them together and tying them or swirling them into various shapes. You know, you could do, um, some of these ribbon manipulations with the fur felt strips. So I'm not going to get rid of this um, waistband because I could still salvage part of it for trim use. Uh, but one thing that I did do that you can see here, this where this uh, belt loop was, there's like four belt loops. They're really big belt loops for a huge belt. And I cut part of one of them off because I wanted to, um, before I cut the skirt up and made this hat with it, I wanted to see if I could figure out what the fiber content of the felt was because it, it felt, it, the felt felt like it was the fur felt, same fur felt that a hat body is made of. Um, but I, I don't want to trust the texture of something that has not been manufactured in my lifetime. So I did a burn test and theoretically 
I, next semester, I'm teaching dye class. And one of the first things we talk about is determining fiber content of a fabric that you don't know what it's woven from. And the way, one way, the easiest way to do that, I think, is a burn test. So you cut a little scrap off of it and you set it on fire and you watch how the flame behaves and then you blow it out and you smell what the smoke smells like and you watch whether it continues to burn in an ember or goes out. What does the ash look like? Is it a little plastic bead? That's how you know it's polyester or acetate, you know. Um, so those are all ways that you analyze the burning of something to figure out what you think it's made of. And this little piece of uh, felt that I burned to see is this what I think it is. It was very slow to catch fire. It didn't want to catch fire. I had to really hold it in the flame for a long period of time. And then when it did burn, it burned a little bit and it, it went out. And that is a property that wool and other animal hair fibers have. They're very hard to catch fire. They're, they're fire flame resistant. Um, from the fire marshal's perspective, a costume made out of wool is considered naturally uh, not flame proof, but naturally flame repellent. So you don't have to spray all the nasty chemicals on it to get it to be acceptable if that character is picking up flame um, like a candle. And the other property of burning fur felt and wool um, and silk even is that it smells like burning hair. Um, most... Oh, I don't want to say that most people know what burning hair smells like, but I personally do um, from curling irons being too hot when I was a teenager and stuff. This smells gross. And um, if you've ever smelled it, you recognize it immediately. So when you burn a little piece of, of an unknown fabric and you're like, oh, gross, smells like burning hair. Okay, it's a protein fiber. It's either wool, alpaca, uh rabbit fur and in, in the case of fur felt it's usually rabbit fur sometimes beaver um and silk which is not a fur but it's produced by animals and it's a protein fiber so it still behaves that way so there's a little tip that um i'll be revisiting again once i get to work on dye class because that's um that is my spring semester class at the theater and or at unc chapel hill where the theater is based and I am going to, um, so my, the focus of the videos on my channel, um, I won't say that'll totally change to dye related topics, but I'm saying that I, I personally will probably still be filming millinery stuff, um, and other related handcrafts just because that's what I practice the most. Um, we also have a show coming up that we just had a design meeting on yesterday that has a lot of hats and masks. Um, so I think I'm gonna be working on some of those, either in the stream or in the video content that goes up on the channel. Um, but there, because Die Class is getting digitized in the, well, it's getting digitized in the next month for spring teaching, some of that content, including maybe a burn test demonstration, uh, will appear in the channel videos. Uh, so the last thing that is going to take up some time here in the studio stream, here we're at um, 3.53, seven more minutes. I can at least get started on this. So this is the last thing that I was thinking I'm I could do if I get to it, maybe, I don't know. Um, this is something that I'm gonna start preparations for, for my dye class. And it's test fabric samples, which if you um, are not familiar with this, and most folks who don't run a dye shop aren't, um, this is the key that tells me what fibers each stripe of this fabric, see this wide ribbon here? Let me, oh, there's a piece on here already. Okay, here's a little piece of it. So this fabric, if you can see some of this, there's, there's I think there's 13 stripes across here. And, and the way that um, 
it's all basically white, but some are a little bit more cream, some of are a little bit grayer. Each one of these stripes on this ribbon is woven from a different fiber. And this is the key that tells me which is which. So there's one, a black stripe on the top end of this. You see right there that black stripe woven along the top of the ribbon. And here on the key, there's the black stripe at the top. And this tells me in order what they are. And so at the theater, I have one of these keys for and a set of swatches for every type of die that we stock. So if we have, well, we do stock writ dies. And so um, the, right now there are 29 colors commercially available in the professional line of writ dies. And so what my graduate students are going to do with this stuff is I assign each of them a group of colors and they dye this strip, each one of their five colors. And then they cut this into six pieces because there's six students in the class. And at the end, you give everybody a set of your colors and receive a set of their colors so you have a complete set of what RIT does on every fiber content that something could be woven out of. Um, she's asking uh, in the YouTube chat whether warp and weft are the same per stripe. And no, they're not. There's, um, I believe it's polypropylene that is uh, the cross threads and it's only the, the stripes going down the length of the grain that are the particular fiber in question. Um, because how, how you, I, I don't know how you could have a fiber that changes purity of, of weave down the, the, I always mix up warp and weft, um, but going across this way, it has to be something that is sort of neutral. And then the way that it's woven, you see most of the fiber going this way. So in this way, the students at the end of this will wind up with a set of swatches for, in normal times, I have them do it for all the classes of dye that we carry or that we stock at Playmakers, but because we're going to have to sign up for limited access to a space that needs to be completely cleaned down and has a lot of surfaces that need to be cleaned, um, we're probably not going to do every class of dye because, frankly, there are some that, like, I stock them because I have a degree in textile science, but... We don't really, like we use them once in a blue moon. Um, so they're definitely going to have a set of writ swatches though, uh, which is probably the most commonly used dye stuff in theatrical context. Um, if you work at a really high end dye house like Dynamics in New York City that not only caters to Broadway, but also does short runs for fashion collections and, and so forth, then you have the capability of uh, gaining, uh, stocking and, and using before they go to the end of their shelf life and are no longer active, um, lots of different types of dyes. But RIT is really sort of the, the standard in theater because it's easy to access almost anywhere in the country. Sometimes you can buy it at like an art store or a hardware store. Um, it dyes most things because it's a union dye stuff, which means it's actually a blend of different kinds of dyes that affect different kinds of fibers. And I have a set of these test fabrics and one of these keys for red dyes and, like I said, lots of other classes of dyes in a notebook at work. And so this is going to allow the students to be able to, in the class with their own starter set, so if they wound up in a position where they are now running the dye shop at a theater, they don't have to worry about buying a big roll of this stuff and dyeing writ samples with every color that they have. Um, they'll just already have them because that's a project. I feel like someone's asking a question that I can't read. 
They never sell it at the grocery stores. They even sell it at the grocery stores. Yes, they even sell writ at the grocery store. So, you know, it it's it's the most useful on a in a, in a circumstance where, like in our field, if our field continues to exist, which uh, I'm sure that it will, but I'm not sure what um, context that will be, you always, you, you always need to be in a position where you can go to the work, whether that means that you have a studio in your home and you fly to wherever the work's being made to fit the actors, or you move to Utah because there's a theater there that needs somebody to run their die shop or whatever. Um, you always will want to have a set of, of these fiber, um, multi-fiber strips um, in writ because that's going to be the die stuff that you walk in and they already have it there. Now, I also use... The one I use second most frequently is fiber reactive cold process dyes, which act only on cellulose fibers. So cotton, linen, rainy, um, hemp, flax. And those dyes, I'm getting hoarse here. Those, those dyes um, are more expensive than RIT and they're, the process is a bit more complex. You need auxiliary chemicals to make the reaction work. Uh, which is not a problem, but with RIT, you can have somebody wash it in a washing machine with a packet of RIT if it just needs to be basically kind of purple. Um, anyway, I see that we have hit four o'clock, which is time to end the stream. So I didn't actually get to the point where I cut any of these strips. I need to cut 29 of these 18-inch uh, strips so my students can then dye their writ samples as their first project um, in the, the spring semester, which is starting late for us because they're really drawing out this winter break. We just had our last class Tuesday. They're in exams now. Exams will be done by Thanksgiving. Um, so the students go home for Thanksgiving and then they don't come back until middle to end of January. Um, I think because they don't know what's going to happen with the pandemic and that's what the university has deemed safest. Uh, we started way earlier this semester. Anyway, thank you so much for joining me in my studio stream today. I didn't really even get to work on anything. I just talked about things I'd worked on. So this was an unusual one. Um, I'm hoping two weeks from now, since there won't be a stream on Thanksgiving, that I'll be to the point where I'm actually working on something instead of just telling you about things that I'm working on. Or maybe I'll be cutting out these stripes um, of, of multi-fiber ribbon. We'll see. Thank you so much for coming. And, uh, like I said, I'm not streaming next Thursday, but I'd love to see you back the following Thursday. I'm here every Thursday at 3 p.m., 3 to 4 p.m., uh, live from my studio with whatever I happen to be working on. It's some type of theater craft. And happy Thanksgiving to all of you guys. If you are Americans and celebrate, if you are abroad, um, well, have a good next week regardless um and that's it i'm gonna end my stream oh i don't know how to do this on instagram it usually just dies on me i haven't had to choose to unlive okay i figured it out bye all right i'm gonna end this oh i'm gonna stream ending soon